So we've started recording and now I am going to go live on Facebook. It's going to take just a moment. It's going to ask me a couple of questions, so we still have a few more seconds here. Okay. Good morning, Note World. This is Bill Griesmer coming to you live from Columbus, Ohio. Uh, my pleasure to be uh, co-hosting and guest hosting on the Note uh, Closer Show podcast this morning. It's my pleasure to be here this morning. I'm with Patty Ped here from Ader Financials in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Good morning, Patty. Good morning, Bill. How are you? I am doing fantastic. I'm really excited to be uh, talking here this morning with everybody. Uh, Patty and I were working really hard and we thought we came up with some really good uh, content for you this morning. Right, Patty? Yes, of course. I'm excited okay. to get started. Fantastic. So uh, Patty and I were talking. We've met a couple times in person and we've um, talked before on social media. Uh, mm -hmm. We've both learned a tremendous amount from Scott Carson. We also do things um, at least a little bit different. Um, we both are really focusing on non-performing firsts right now. Um, but Patty, one thing that you might do a little bit different, it's my understanding that um, not too long ago you were investing in second mortgages and you've yes. been changing your focus now to invest uh, partially or at least mostly for the time being in first mortgages. You want to tell us a little bit about that and uh, why you chose to do that? Sure, yeah. Um, so for everyone who is joining us for the first time, I'm Patty Pad. I am with Ader Financials. We are a private mortgage investment firm based out of central Pennsylvania. We do purchase um, or invest in notes nationwide, uh, but we do have some favorite states, which we're gonna go into uh, detail in a little bit. Uh, but as Bill here mentioned, we were, we started off investing um, in non, in actually performing seconds. Uh, once we got a hang of it, once we learned what the note business was about, uh, we liked seeing those checks in our account every month. Um, but we learned about non-performing seconds and um, we learned about the um, ROI being more, which also means the risk is more. Uh, so we wanted to venture into that and see how that would work out for us. And it worked really well. Um, then we started learning about first non-performing mortgages and the differences between the two. And as you know, the second space and the first space, they're both entirely different. Um, the way you deal with things, your due diligence, your focus, the amount of time and work you would spend on the borrower itself and the note itself, uh, servicing the entire thing, managing it, they're completely different in both of them. Um, and uh, we, we felt like for our personality, the second, the first phase was better suited. Um, and I think we, we ran into a couple of scenarios in our seconds where we really wanted to help out the borrower, but because they were already um, delinquent on their first and the first was uh, getting ready to foreclose on them, we weren't able to help the borrower as much as we like to. We were trying to negotiate with the first uh, on behalf of the borrower and we were trying to get them some great uh, deal going on. And luckily we did do that this time. <laughs> um, but we realized that it was more challenging to provide the help 
that we want to in, in a second mortgage rather than in a first. So when you're a first mortgage note holder, you are first in line, you have a lot of flexibility going there, and uh, you have a lot of options that you could provide to the borrower and ensure that they can keep their home. Uh, which is our primary intent. We want the borrowers to keep their home. We want them to be, um, you know, happy about their choices. So, um, so I, I, I think the one of the main reasons we switched to first was that it allowed us to do that um, in in the first. Mm -hmm. and like I mentioned before, for our personality, I felt like first was a better option for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I kind of thought right along the same lines there. Um, on my account, one thing that I do, or at least I have done in the past, a little bit different. I initially started off um, just thinking I was going to buy and use performing notes. And at the time, similar to what Patty's saying, I thought, you know, I did an inventory on my goals and situation and what I was trying to do. And I really thought performing notes was, you know, just going to be the ticket, going to be the bomb. Mm -hmm. And they worked out okay. Um, a, uh, some were better than others, obviously. If you've seen uh, some of my other presentation, you've seen me talk about at least one of them that became a problem child. But the thing that I really came to conclude with performing notes, it's kind of like buying a stock way up at the uh, top of its value. Uh, performing notes are expensive. Um, if everything continues to go well and that borrower continues to pay, then uh, you're doing good. Um, but if something goes wrong, if that borrower, uh, you know, loses a job, gets divorced, um, has health problems, has medical bills, whatever, and then they stop paying, you just uh, instantly overpaid for a non-performing note. And uh, the non-performing note, that takes, you know, longer to work out and um, it's more expensive. And if you came at that from a performing note level, that, that becomes uh, very problematic. Um, it does happen sometimes that you can buy, a, you know, what's considered a performing note and then it becomes non-performing. Yeah. So they both have their place, uh, both performing and non-performing notes. But... Just exactly like Patty said, based on my situation um, and my goals and circumstance, and just I just see more opportunity right now, at least with regards to non-performing note. However, and this is a big but, um, a good deal is a good deal. Whether it's performing, whether it's non-performing, uh, a good deal definitely is a good deal. Uh, right, Patty? So you had mentioned that... Um, you had some other uh, decisions that you were making and uh, continue to make about your uh, buying criteria in the states that you buy in. Why don't you uh, tell us about that, Patty? Sure. Um, so it was tough initially because there are 50 states and we got to, <laughs> so we wanted to focus on say the top five instead of trying to be all over the place. And we some people will even buy, uh, you know, in other countries even. That, that, that even amazes me. I know. Right, with 50 states, it's, um, it's <laughs> quite a bit to start with. Yeah, yeah. So we, we spoke to a lot of investors, senior investors who've been doing this for many, many years now. And uh, we're trying to find out why they chose the states that they did. And the short answer is it's entirely up to the investor. Uh, just because I say that I invest in these states and these are good for me, it doesn't mean it may be good for you. Um, so you have to come up with your own list of states. And these are some of the things that we sort of went through when we started making this list is we made a decision matrix uh, with all 50 states and then items such as, is it a judicial or non-judicial state? Um, do they do trust deeds or... Do, do they have hardest hit funds? Do they have uh, super liens, HOA? Um, how many months it takes to foreclose? It doesn't, again, it doesn't mean that because it's a longer duration, we don't want to do it. We just need to know what it is so we can factor in those costs into our ROI calculators and make sure we're not, um, you know, over calculating things or we're not 
thinking that we're going to get like a 40% ROI on it. And then we realized it's, it's, it's a 11 month foreclosure time frame, And then you only end up with like $10,000 or whatever. So we, we, we just need to know these things to make sure that we're making informed decisions about these deals. Um, similarly about HOA liens, if it's a state where the HOA could be a super lien, uh, we just need to make sure that we, when we do our due diligence, we call the HOA and we ask them if there's any liens on it. And if they say, yeah, it's $200, then we just add that into our ROI calculator and make sure we're accounting for it. So again, it doesn't mean we're not investing in that state. We just want to be aware of what the situation is. Um, uh, some states have redemption periods. Uh, for say, Alabama has almost a one year redemption period. And this is, um, so when, in, when it becomes an REO, when it goes to a foreclosure sale, and when it becomes an REO, you literally have to, I wouldn't say wait, but you have to actually make sure you're not spending too much in that one year period of time because the borrower could come back anytime, pay you the unpaid principal balance and whatever payoff costs were and take the property back. Now, if you've spent money on the grass cutting or making it look pretty or anything else, you're kind of losing all of that money when the borrower does that. Right. So when it's a long redemption period, you just want to make sure um, that you're not putting too much money into it before you know what the situation is and until you're sure what's going to happen there. I've heard uh, some investors even go to the um, borrower and uh, essentially buy out their redemption rights. Uh, you can yes. generally buy those pretty cheap under some circumstances, right? Yes, absolutely. Yep. Uh, we've, we've done that in, a, in one case and uh, it, it worked out great. And like I said, well, that's, but that was one of our decision points to make sure we knew what we were getting into. Right. Um, and then talking about deficiency judgments. In some states, if the borrower, if the property is underwater, and we usually invest in underwater properties, um, the, you could potentially get a deficiency judgment for the remaining amount. Um, let's say the borrower owes you $100,000, but the property was only worth 50,000 or 60,000. You could get a deficiency judgment for the remaining 40,000, uh, which you could still collect from the borrower, though not on the property itself. So that's something uh, that we try to go over and look at for each state to see what the laws are in that state. Um, and, um, and yeah, we, we looked at the total costs um, to see what the attorney costs are, what the court costs are. And one of the main things that I've seen, at least I've struggled with initially was publication costs. Um, like for example, Oregon, uh, the attorney costs and foreclosure costs are not so bad but publication itself costs $4,000. And we learned that the hard way. <laughs> um, but, that, but that's something that we've been making a good um, matrix or a, a table about what the costs are in each state, which will help us, of course, calculate our ROI and see how much we need to put in before we see anything back. So that's uh, important for everyone to just take note of. Uh, you know, she's looking and uh, seeing she's collecting data and then she's trying to put it in an easy to use format so that she can use that then to continue to improve what she's doing and continue to make better decisions going into the future. That's a really important note for um, anyone watching to try to, you know, learn and incorporate into really whatever business it, it is that they're doing. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And, and the thing I like about this model is that once I have it in an Excel format or in an editable format, Fannie Mae releases new um, guidelines for attorney costs and court costs every, I think every two years, if I'm not wrong. So, or once year, I don't know. Don't quote me on that. Um, but every time Fannie Mae comes there's back- There's no test here, there's no test, Patty. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of blanked out for a minute though. I was like, was it one year or two years? Um, but yeah, so every time I get the court costs back or the attorney costs back, 
um, I go back and update my numbers in my sheet so that I don't have to remember to go back to the source every time. So it's, it's, it's nice to have that flexibility with the data that I have here. Um, so yeah, based on all of these decisions, it, I, I picked out a few states. Uh, for, for us personally, we've, we have Ohio, Indiana, uh, Florida, Florida, Michigan, Tennessee, and Texas. And we've also added Missouri and South Carolina to the list. Um, and one of the most important aspects of this was our power team. We make sure in all of these states that we have good attorneys, uh, our servicers uh, do the servicing there, and realtors are there to do the drive-bys and get us the numbers and make sure um, it's in a good rental area and all that. Um, and I know we'll go into a little bit of detail about this later. So that's one of, um, one of the ways that we've reached that decision based on all of these factors and um, a power team. And how about you, Bill? Yeah, I, I concur with uh, quite a bit of what you just said. Um, my top three states are Ohio, Indiana, and Michigan. Um, occasionally I'll get into uh, Florida, Tennessee, and Missouri also. Um, how I, I ended up going about this, um, a lot of what Patty said, but just breaking it down even a little more simply and practically. Um, I live uh, near Columbus, Ohio. Uh, those first three states I said, Ohio, Indiana, and Michigan, they're all within one day of driving distance of me. So if something really uh, went wrong, I could uh, just at any given day get up and drive there. The, the top part of Michigan, the upper peninsula, that might be a little bit of a stretch. But even that, I mean, I can get there in about 13 to 14 hours. Um, in addition, I have a really good attorney that's licensed in all three of those states. Uh, again, that's part of your uh, power team, your super friends team that we're going to talk about here. Mm -hmm. um, those three states, they're kind of right in the heart of the Midwest. I definitely am a Midwest guy at heart, and uh, I like trying to help as best I can, you know, the area that I am from and uh, that I like the best. Um, and then also I have friends that live in all three of those states. And uh, you got to be careful what you ask of your friends. I wouldn't expect, uh, you know, a friend just because we're uh, buddies to go and drive, you know, eight hours or something. But if it's within, you know, a short distance from them, they might be able to stop by a house, do a drive by, something like that, or uh, just go put something up on the door if need be, or uh, whatever the case may be. Um, also, the laws aren't too bad in those areas. Like Patty mentioned, different states have different laws. That's something to, um, <coughs> excuse me, keep in mind for note investors. Um, each state is going to vary a little bit different. And I definitely agree 100% with what Patty said. Just because these are my states doesn't mean they can or should be the states for everybody else. Uh, my friend Chris Seveny, he even said he likes to invest in states that uh, some people shy away from. There's less competition there, and um, if you know how all those laws work, then it can still work out pretty well for you. Uh, my friend Dave Putz, he lives in New Jersey, and so he's told me that he'll sometimes buy in either New Jersey or New York, even though those particular states generally most note investors shy away from because they have longer periods of foreclosure and such. But again, he lives there, he's familiar with those states, um, so that's kind of down in his wheelhouse. Uh, another thing I try to do is buy um, assets with a uh, minimum uh, fair market value. That's again, the as is value right now of really at least $40,000. That's not to say I would 100% rule out anything lower than that, but my threshold to buy and my projected return better be even quite a bit higher than uh, I'm normally looking for. Why is that? Why $40,000? Well, if you're buying a house that has a, uh, you know, a uh, $20,000 as is value, and yes, homes like that exist out in the country, and um, say uh, your projected return is even, I don't know, call it 50%, call it $10,000. Um, your margin of safety there is roughly $10,000 then, right? It's not mm -hmm. that difficult, especially on a, a more inexpensive house, to really blow through $10,000. 
Uh, if there's, you know, structural damage or if it does end up needing a, a roof or something like that, you're cutting deeply into your rate of return right off the bat versus if the house is a little more expensive, uh, the cost to foreclose is the same on a more expensive house versus a really inexpensive house. Um, a lot of those uh, costs are not that much more with a more expensive house, but you just have a little bit greater margin of safety. Um, my minimum uh, projected um, rate on uh, rate of investment, uh, return on investment for me, I'd try to shoot for at least 25%, uh, especially if I'm doing it on a JV partner. If it's just my cash um, and uh, I, I like the deal enough, I'll sometimes go down to 20%. Uh, it's the old saying, um, uh, pigs get slaughtered, you know, um, <laughs> if you try to take too, too much or, uh, you end up sometimes not doing so well. Yeah. Uh, and then with a non-performing full note and mortgage, I will try to avoid homes that have uh, a lot of homeowner equity or borrower equity. Uh, generally under those circumstances, the homeowner probably knows that and there's a much greater chance that they're going to try to fight you tooth and nail and they can really slow down the foreclosure process. So that's a little background between how um, Patty and I go about making decisions and the type of factors that we look at. Uh, so then Patty and I were talking up some more things about kind of building your team. She touched on that already and you really can't do this business all alone as a note investor. Um, it's important for you to have a team, to have vendors, and it's really, really helpful to try to establish some type of a relationship ahead of time. Uh, think about it. You know, who's going to uh, probably get quicker service? You know, uh, a friend, if you're a vendor or say you're, you know, selling insurance and you've got one guy that, you know, he's already, I've met him at a conference or he gave me a phone call. Uh, I know the name of his company. I've heard his name. And then someone else that just calls me completely out of the blue. Well, human being, human nature being what it is, he's going to try to help both, of course. That's how he makes his living. But I'd say he's more likely to help the guy that, you know, he already has at least a little bit of a relationship uh, with. And especially uh, if he's already a current customer. Um, so going through these vendors, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how we find them or how we uh, try to decide on them. Um, you can always do research online and uh, trying to have yourself even a team, even a network of cohorts um, like our WCN crew, our We Close Notes crew. Um, that's very, very helpful. You're kind of tapping into the um, you know, whole collective knowledge base of a number of people. Because again, no one and absolutely no one knows everything. So a good mentor ought to be able to help you with this. So one of the first and most important uh, members of your team, Patty, I think would be uh, uh, finding and using a local realtor. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, that is very correct. Uh, because the role of a realtor starts off even before you actually purchase the note. So. The way we usually do it is one, we do our initial due diligence, we put in a bid, uh, and once the bid gets accepted, we ha reach out to our realtors and in that specific area. If we don't already have a realtor, we usually find, try to find them through either Active Rain or Zillow or any of the other websites out there, Trulia or Realtor.com or whatever is available. So once we have uh, made contact with a realtor, we explain to them what we're trying to do, uh, what our business structure is and how we're, uh, what we need from them. And we, the, the way it has usually worked out is um, when the, if and when the the uh, property or the asset becomes an REO is when the realtor would be asked to be the selling agent and the listing agent for the property. So in exchange for that, they're, um, they're usually doing the drive-bys for us. And we've had pretty good success with this model. Uh, recently, actually, we, we had another Huntington one where we did a similar thing where the realtor was very happy to do the drive-by for us. Uh, she took a couple of pictures uh, from all angles to give us a sense for what the 
the property looks like today. And we're not just looking at a photo on Google that was from 10 years ago. Um, so she, uh, uh, the realtor also gives us the uh, estimated repairs, what the rentals are in the area, uh, what the market is currently. And again, this current market may not be the same by the time you actually get to selling the house, which may be four months from now or you know, almost a year from now. It's gonna vary, of course, but you get a sense for what's going on and how, um, um, how that would affect your numbers. Um, she'll also tell us what the after repair values are like and uh, if there's any major uh, developments going on in the area, what, what she's, she sees as the future of the property. Um, the realtor may also be able to tell us if they already have a real um, an investor who's actively looking uh, for properties in that area. Usually they do um, because they've, and, and these are realtors who are uh, experienced in working with investors. So they usually have a couple of investors who are uh, ready to purchase a property in the area and who, who have certain criteria that may match what we are uh, looking at. So this certainly helps. And uh, once we have that initial conversation with them, uh, if we try out a couple of different realtors and once we know that they're a good fit for us, we add them to our list of uh, realtors. Uh, and next time anything comes up in the area, they are our go-to person for this. We, we don't wanna sh do this all over again. If we have a good relationship, and, and this adds back to what you mentioned before about forming relationships. If we have a good working relationship with somebody, we want to maintain that. And um, that, that's how both of us um, get business and get things done. So, and, and what have your experiences have been, uh, Bill? Oh, I think I lost you there. Are you muted? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I did mute myself for a moment. My apologies, audience. No problem. Um, yes, I will say uh, you just want to make sure you communicate with the realtor right up front and kind of set expectations. Um, I've had some realtors charge me, you know, for going out and doing a drive by or a BPO and I've had others not. Um, it all depends. Uh, the one thing I would recommend is just try to t tell them and say, hey, if I do end up getting this house, uh, I will list it with you. And that's, um, let's face it, that's a lot more lucrative than um, just charging someone 50 or 75 or $100 for a drive-by and a BPO. And then as a last resort, uh, you can look at you know, using a national uh, company. Uh, we go look um, is, a, is an example of that. I personally have never used them. I've heard uh, kind of mixed reviews myself. But um, let's face it, time is very important. Um, and that's a big determinant in who you end up using. Um, if you talk to a realtor and said, well, I can't get out there till next week. Eh, a week's a long time. You're probably better off, you know, letting your fingers do the walking and trying to find another realtor. And if you're really striking out, like I said, that's when you can consider then a national company. So uh, title reports would be another member of your super team that is very important. Uh, pro title seems to be the market leader with this. Uh, tax title and blighted property, those are kind of the three main areas that a lot of investors can really get into trouble that can really kill deals. Uh, the, probably, the, in my opinion, the most important thing with a title company um, and get looking at title reports whether it's a full full blown title report or an O and E, which is a little bit of a stripped down version, is uh, you know can you talk to them? Will they answer questions? That type of thing. Uh, that that's that's my thoughts, Patty. Yours? I I agree, Bill. Um, because as initial investors, it's not always um, like out there what what you can what amount of information is available in an o &E report. There's tons of it, but you need to know what to look for and what are the red flags in this particular asset. So, right. uh, and, I've, and we've, we've used ProTitle before. Alex is wonderful. Uh, if you have any questions about it or if, you're, if you feel like there's a discrepancy or we don't understand what's going on, 
uh, we give Alex a call and then he's able to walk us through the report and he's able to tell us uh, why you know it shows up the way it does and what that means which is the most important part for me having the data is not enough it ha it has to be meaningful information yeah so alex and protitle helps us with that part where they convert the data into useful information that we could utilize to uh, make some of the decisions that we do Right. So uh, moving on here, the next member of your super team would be um, note sources. And uh, Stephen King wrote in his book on writing, you know, writers write. <laughs> Lots of people want to be a writer, but they don't write. So his whole point was writers write. Well, you know, to kind of um, adapt that, note investors buy. You know, um, so having note sources that you can use to buy inventory, that is really important. Uh, there's different places you can go to that. Um, you can go to the online exchanges. Um, Val Satir at Watermark does a really nice job. Um, there's uh, Paul Burkett at uh, Automation, and there's um, you know the Granites and FCIs of the world. Um, mm -hmm. They're really great uh, for just to have easy access. Um, they are likely to be a little bit more expensive than some other sources also. Uh, you can go straight direct to banks. That can be uh, time consuming. Um, I personally, as part of, uh, you've probably heard Scott talk about the Banking Blitzkrieg project. Um, I personally called each and every bank in the state of Tennessee a couple months ago. Um, I really thought I, I anticipated getting a lot more tapes. Um, I got a couple things here and there, um, but not a lot of, um, you know, a full blown tape that you could really do something with. Um, and then uh, there's hedge funds. Uh, hedge funds are kind of probably in the middle there. Um, they're probably a little easier to buy from, but that can also take some time to really uh, set up relationships and that type of thing. And then lastly, there's some investors. I know my friend Dave uh, Franecki in uh, Arizona. Um, he's been doing direct mail and trying to uh, send postcards and letters to uh, homeowners that you know maybe recently uh, sold a house with uh, seller financing and uh, maybe they just want to sell the note and uh, that can certainly be done um, that can be kind of time consuming too uh, to you know wade through each and every um, you know homeowner there so uh, Patty do you have uh, any thoughts or any insight on note sources and um, what has worked for you Yes, uh, so you mentioned banks. I was, I was literally cold calling banks almost five hours a day at, a, at one point of time. Oh, wow. wow. That's, a, that's about what I was doing. Yes, but the important thing about banks is going back to your point about relationships. The first time you make a call, you're not going to get a tape you're probably not even going to be talking to the right person. Exactly. Um, you'll probably reach the front desk and they'll half the time, or I would say 80% of the time, they wouldn't even know what you're talking about because they've never <laughs> heard that before, or they have, they don't even know that these loans could be sold to somebody. Right. Um, yes. So having, I, I think Scott provides a script for uh, talking to these banks also. Mm -hmm. um, so having that in front of me definitely helped initially, now that I have it by heart, but initially having that script was very helpful and trying to um, use the right terms when I talk to them um, and, and ask them pertinent questions because they don't wanna waste time on, you know, trying to explain their condition to you. you technically, you should already know that. Um, but again, going back to the, the cold calling aspect of it, once you do reach uh, or are able to make contact with a certain bank manager, it usually takes a few exchanges between you and them before you can actually see something from them. Um, and Scott's magic number and marketing magic number is five. You need to make at least five contacts with them before you see anything uh, back from them. And that the, when I say contacts, I mean email, phone, um, 
Twitter, LinkedIn, however you're connecting with them. So they need to see your name and associate with you at least five times before they can trust you and uh, you can have a meaningful connection. So my, my advice to new investors is if you've made a couple of calls or even a hundred calls to the banks, don't be disheartened because that's just the beginning of the process. A lot of investors spend all of this time calling banks and then one week goes by and they just give up. And that's really not how it works. You got to keep going at it. You got to keep uh, connecting the same with the same people again and again. And you got to make sure that you're putting your name out there and marketing yourself and your company very well. So the banks understand that you're not this newbie who's going after, um, you know, the, you know, chasing squirrels. You're here to do business with them and you're serious about this. And if you can, in your emails or in your con, you know, conversations with them, if you can mention some of the deals that you've done, uh, some of the deals that you've closed recently or anything that can provide a kind of a background about your investment and prove to them how serious you are about this, it certainly helps uh, the banks understand that you're you're really look you're not trying to broker not you're not trying to make a quick buck off of these and you're a serious investor um, so certainly and and a, one more thing to note is that you're not going to get a tape of say a hundred or two hundred notes from banks when you buy from especially if you're looking at smaller banks you're just gonna see two or three or sometimes even just one asset that they're looking to sell mm -hmm. Um, and once you do go over the details, if you feel like that's not up to or matching your criteria, you can always go back to the bank and say, hey, this is what we're looking for. Um, but I do have another investor who may be interested. And do you mind if I shared this with them? You need to take the bank's permission to do that because of course you've signed a non-disclosure agreement with them and you wouldn't want to mass advertise whatever deal they have. Um, that would be a big no-no. So please don't do that. Uh, make sure <laughs> you seek the bank's permission before you go ahead and market their deal. Um, and also mass marketing is not good when it comes to banks. Um, you need to have a preferred list of investors who you've either talked to before, again, at least five times, um, or who you've invested with before, who you have a good personal relationship with. So that certainly helps in uh, trying to identify serious investors again and make sure that you're not wasting the bank's time or you're not wasting the investor's time here. Yep. Uh, that's a lot of really good stuff, Patty. Uh, thanks for that. Thank you. So another uh, member of your team is um, someone to do either your collateral review, uh, collateral file, either review and or storage. This could be you, um, you personally being the investor. Uh, it all depends on you. Um, if you're an investor, it's probably a good idea to um, have experienced eyes look at it. Um, there's companies that you can use, uh, such as Orion or uh, Richmond Monroe. Mm -hmm. um, you can also have an attorney do it. Uh, you can also uh, many times pay a servicer to do it. I know uh, Sh uh, Madison and Shantae will do it for you. You just want to make sure that, you know, wh before you close on that and fork over a lot of money, that it is an enforceable lien and just to make sure that collateral file is uh, complete. And then likewise, when you look at storage, you can either look at who's going to hold the actual file with, you know, the pieces of paper with the actual ink on the page. That is very important. It's not a complete deal changer if it gets lost, but it will cost you time and money in order to fix that. So mm -hmm. ideally, you want to make sure that those files are uh, kept safe and secure. Um, you can either keep it yourself or you can use a company to do it or sometimes your servicer will do it. Um, if you do hold it yourself, I do recommend that you use a uh, fireproof safe. Um, you know, I sometimes joke that if my house were to burn down, uh, a lot of my possessions would be gone, but my the loans of my, uh, the notes <laughs> I own, I've got them locked in a fireproof safe myself. Um, 
that should be intact. That should be able to ride out a fire. So uh, that's my thoughts on that, Patty. That's, that's great. Um, the other thing I wanted to add to that was that uh, when you board your files, and we've not used Richmond Monroe yet, but we have been using Orion. Uh, when, when we board our loans with Orion, they do a quick um, review of the contents of the collateral file. So if it's missing any assignments of mortgage right. or any allonges or any, if they feel, if they see that there's only a copy of the mortgage or the note uh, and they don't see the originals in there, they catch all of this and they send you an email uh, saying that, hey, these are the files that we've received. These are the files that are missing. Uh, so did you want us to go ahead and get these assignments recorded for you? Or did you want to do that yourself? So there's a lot of um, value addition to using a company like Orion. If you're a first time investor and you do not completely understand how the collateral process works, I would highly recommend using somebody like Orion uh, because they would, uh, like I said, review your entire file. They'll send you a summary email saying that this is what your collateral file contains. These are the missing documents. And um, if you are interested, they are also available to record your assignments of mortgage um, and go back to your seller and a couple of layers before that and get off get all the allonges and everything else for you so i think that's a for me that was a good value addition from them yeah so moving right along another super friend you're going to need is uh insurance and preferably you'll want to have an insurer that can insure homes uh really nationwide and um Speedy Gonzalez would be a uh, would be ideal. Uh, trying to find someone that you can work with quickly that's going to make sure you get insurance on something. Uh, speed is of the essence. Um, you're really at a risk if uh, your property is not insured. Um, not too much to say about that, other than you know insurance is important just for uh, ensuring the value of your investment, right, Patty? Yes, absolutely. So the, one of the, that's one of the first things we do as soon as we purchase the note and we start boarding it up with the servicer. Um, we, make, we reach out to the insurance company. We use a national real estate insurance group for most of our uh, properties here. And we ask them for forced placed insurance. And um, they have a questionnaire that you fill out that asks you uh, what the property is worth, uh, where it's located, of course, uh, the address of it, and uh, other questions related to the property that'll help them come up with the uh, monthly insurance costs or a yearly insurance cost. And um, again, these numbers are very helpful. Uh, once you do a couple of them, you kind of get a sense for how much it will cost. And in some areas, uh, especially Florida, you need flood insurance uh, and other types of insurance. And the best part about forced place insurances uh, is that if the borrower, if you're able to make contact with the borrower and if they come back and say that they have, they already have insurance on the property, then you, you can actually cancel these insurances from, and save some uh, money on that. So when you talk to an insurance company, make sure that this exists, that there is an option to cancel and you need to ask them if there's a penalty to cancel or uh, you need to pay two months in advance or what, what the situation is uh, before you go ahead and do that. So that's one of the important questions you need to remember. Right. right. So uh, another key member would be... Um, and I'll kind of lump these together just because uh, for time constraints here, making sure that you have uh, good uh, contact and good um, relationship with a servicer and then possibly a special servicer, depending on your loan. Uh, the servicer, you really want to make sure they're licensed um, if they have to be in the state that your asset is in. Um, I'm not positive, but I think uh, some states you don't have to be licensed. Um, I could be wrong on that, but uh, in general, you want to just know that. And then if that is needed, make sure the servicer is licensed in the state you're working in. 
And then customer service is really, really important. And some servicers, no one servicer is perfect for every single situation. Um, different servicers actually have different strengths and uh, fee schedules and costs. So the best thing you can do probably is just try to, again, set up a relationship with them, meeting them at a conference, kind of trying to get an idea of what, they, um, what they're all about, what they're good at, what they're, where you think might not be a good fit, um, and then trying to make your best decision with that. Uh, your special servicers, that's kind of the um, SEAL Team 6 of uh, servicers. Um, they're going to help you do your workouts uh, for non-performing notes a little more quickly a lot of times than a uh, regular servicer will. Um, they'll get the uh, fast right party contact very quickly. Uh, there's Polaris and then the law office of Daniel Singer. Uh, a, lot of our, um, a lot of our group tends to kind of be the go-to guys there. Um, thoughts on servicers and special servicers, Patty? You might be muted. Yes, just realized that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so yes, when we talk about special servicers, uh, I really love them. One of the main reasons is what you mentioned, where if you're using a regular servicer, there are certain CFPB rules that you need to follow uh, and make sure you're you're waiting a 30-day period after you give them a notice of default, and you need to wait for it to get I'm sorry, before that, you need to wait for it to get boarded. So there's a one and a half month to two months time period where you're just, where you bought between you buying the note and you're actually doing something about it. So a special services certainly helps during this time period where they act as a counselor to this. They're not debt collectors. They're not there to harass the borrower. Uh, it's in fact the opposite of that. Special services is there to counsel them, to help them um, understand what their hardships have been, um, how how they can actually um, figure out if they could reorganize some of the finances and all of that. Uh, they're there to collect information about the borrower, bring it back to us, the lenders. Um, so we understand their situations better and we're able to provide better options, more flexible options to them based on uh, the information collected by them. Um, they'll also help you if you are trying to do a deed in lieu with them or if you're trying to do um, uh, cash for keys or anything of that sort. The special servicer, again, is there to help you. They're, uh, they're talking to the borrower. They're the front end of your business and they're, they're there to help you. One of the things that I do want to point out for the special servicers is that um, when you look at the servicing comments before you purchase the note, you can most likely get a sense for if it's going to be a re-performer, if it's going to be a foreclosure, or if it's going to be uh, what what kind of what the borrower intent has been over the past few years. And of course, it may change any time. Uh, you can't base your decision completely on that, uh, but it certainly gives you a sense for where it's going to go. So if you see that the there have been door knock attempts before and the borrower has never responded to any of them and he was, let's say the borrower was rude and just slammed the door in their face. Um, oh, be rude? That never happens, does it? <laughs> yeah, no, it doesn't. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, we've had cases like that. <laughs> <laughs> big sigh, big sigh there. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but the the thing is, we did send our special servicer back out there, and the same thing repeated. So we kind of felt like with with some experience working on some files now, we know that if it's happened in the past, there is a chance that it's gonna happen now. Again, there is a chance, I'm not saying it's gonna happen, uh, but it's it's the most likely scenario. Or there may be times when the borrower's finally uh, ready to talk and they'd actually need a special servicer there. Uh, but I'm talking about the, the usual cases. So in those scenarios, 
we kind of go back and look at certain other factors before we decide to hire a special servicer for those kind of loans. Yep, so um, almost through here. So uh, one other thing, uh, and this will kind of depend uh, at least partly a little bit on uh, where you're buying, um, but especially if you're buying, say, north of the Mason-Dixon line, um, having a property preservation uh, company, and sometimes they'll actually do, you know, uh, some contracting or some uh, home repair if need be, but the key there is making sure a home is winterized. Um, you don't want, uh, you know, the mutant ice man or the winter warlock kind of taking up uh, residence in your um, uh, empty, uh, you know, house after you foreclose on it, for example. So making sure you get someone in there to do the winterization is key. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Um, so a couple of other ones here then. Um, Investors and JV partners, that can really be its own topic. And uh, many minutes get spent on that. And I'm sure books get spent on that. And that gets into, uh, you know, marketing and sales and that type of thing. But just put it as simply and uh, basically as you can. I, I, one of the, if not the most important things is really from the start, setting up clear expectations and setting up clear communication and, um, you know, in the words of Steve Lloyd, um, I had the great pleasure of uh, meeting him. I believe you probably did too, Patty, or at least see him at uh, DME in February. Um, always just make sure you do, you're do. you doing what you said you were going to do. Um, especially in today's world, that doesn't always happen. And so if you can be one of those people that does what they say they're going to do, that really can set you apart. It sounds so simple, but it really is true. I, I agree. This the the most important thing about investors or joint venture partners is at, at least what we try to do is under promise and over deliver is the first thing um, we make sure we're not you know bringing them into the hall with these big numbers and flashy signs and then when they come in uh, you know there's nothing there so we make sure that doesn't happen right. um, we also try to be very transparent in our proceedings. We give them a Google file folder uh, where we store all of our documents, the collateral, the receipts, everything gets stored in there. So they're looking at every single thing that we are looking at uh, on the file. Um, and they and we've had both types of investors, active and passive. Uh, the passive ones usually just want to know, okay, am I getting money this month or not? Or how's it going? Um, the, pass, uh, the active ones are a little more involved. They want to learn the business. They want to just related to what we're talking about today. They want to learn why we made the decisions that we did and what we could have done differently or what what the consequences are of, of taking different routes through the process. Um, so they're a little more actively involved through the process and uh, they're learning uh, everything about the, the note as much as they can. Um, so yeah, I, I completely agree to Steve Lloyd's point where he says um, at the end of it, you have to make sure that that investor is happy. The, the main goal of this whole process is to make your investor happy, right. your borrower right. happy, and if you're buying it from a bank or, or a seller, your seller should also be happy. They shouldn't feel like it's a ripoff. So just, just make sure that, and the, the, one of the, the main important things that the investor looks for is reliability and security. Even if they know, even if it's the, the deal's going south, or you see some problems with the deals, the, the investors want to know about it and they want you to be honest and reliable uh, in, in what you're doing. So I, I completely agree with that point though. Yeah. So the last thing is not necessarily the least of course is um, having a coach or a mentor. And um, again, this will depend a little bit on the person, um, but I can tell you a very good coach is very, uh, very valuable. 
Um, some of you might know I'm a physical therapist, but I also actually train with a strength coach, a professional strength and fitness and conditioning coach. And it's been a really good um, relationship for both of us. I do have to say that I'm stronger now than I've ever been, partly because of him. He just comes at things from a little bit different angle, but then he's also listened to me and added some exercises before. So um, in terms of note investing, I mean, both Patty and I are students and um, of Scott Carson. Uh, we both think very highly of him. Um, in addition to him just being a really top-notch coach, uh, it's partly the network and the, uh, the team of students that he has. Um, if someone doesn't fit in, uh, they don't tend to hang around very long, and that's okay. Not everybody is going to be a fit for everybody. Uh, you have to really find uh, both the coach and then the team that's going to be a really good fit for you, and that's going to be a little bit different for everybody. Um, you know, the, the one thing I can think about, just having a winning mindset and a winning culture uh, like uh, I got to give a shout out here, Urban Meyer and the Ohio State Buckeyes. You know, a couple years ago, they won the national title with their third string quarterback. And um, I'm a Cleveland professional sports fans, but they can learn a tremendous amount just about a, a winning culture and uh, expectations and working hard and just expecting good things to happen to you. You know, at OSU, the, uh, Again, they, their top two quarterbacks got hurt, and then the third guy just stepped right in, and the team just kept right on rolling. Um, everyone knew what they were expected to do. They had clear roles. They talk about it in this book. Um, above the line is the um, you know uh, motto that they use, uh, the uh, outcome is, de is dependent upon the event, and then your response to it. Um, that's E plus R equals O. Uh, that's the big, big uh, equation that they use for that. So uh, that's my thoughts on that. Uh, Patty, thoughts about, you know, a coach or mentor or team of cohorts or anything like that? Yeah, uh, that is, I think, one of the, the most important things in the note business, especially because, like you mentioned, this is a very close-knit, tight community of um, friends and investors. And uh, it certainly helps, especially if you're a newbie, it certainly helps to have that note family or the network that can help you out, um, not just with um, you know, how you do your business, but also finding vendors. Uh, they can provide recommendations as to um, um, you know, who they've, they've used before or what their, their experiences have been. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the having a note family is very important. And going back to the mentors part, we I don't think we could have come this far without having good mentors. And we've been very, very lucky in that aspect. Uh, when we started off in seconds, we had Fuquan Bilal um, and Matt Allen, who, uh, and Fuquan has amazing content on YouTube and on his website where he, um, explains the node investing process and what we need to look at, especially in the seconds area. Uh, we've also attended several webinars and training sessions of um, Dave Van Horn. In fact, he was the very first person uh, who had inspired us to get into the node business. Uh, PPR, they're right across, uh, like a few hours from here, they're from Pennsylvania as well, Dave is. Um, so yeah, Dave uh, was very instrumental actually to get into this field for us. Um, we've, we've done a lot of different trainings, a lot of different um, uh, webinars, and we're still learning, we're still doing all of that. And again, in the first phase, Sot has been amazing with his training programs, with his content. Yep. Uh, the note buying blueprint was one of the very first ones we did. And I loved the content and the way it was structured. It was uh, for an analytical person like me. If you talk about really? it, <laughs> if you can tell already, <laughs> um, if you just talk about it in the air, I may be able to follow you, but I won't get the full picture. Yeah. I need to mm -hmm. have it in a very structured format for me to wrap my head around it. And Scott certainly has that. He has a little bit of both, which is amazing. 
um, I, I think it caters to both the left and the right brain. Um, so then we started off with the note camp and we were there. And note camp is also awesome because we're not just there listening to pe new people, new, new in the sense um, for that note camp investors, but they're actually senior investors or not just investors, they've been attorneys and services and all of the power team that we mentioned. So they're all there talking about their respective uh, services and how uh, or why we need those services in our new business. And the, the good part is also the base camp group where you're asking questions, where you're posting your um, deal questions or any questions that you may have. And you have this entire family of note campers who are there to help you out with that. Um, and then we recently did the fast track and uh, Chris and I did a, a recent podcast on this on May 25th, I guess. Um, wow. episode, episode 280, guys, catch it <laughs> if you haven't already. Um, so fast track is also amazing because you're actually sitting down one-on-one -on -one with Scott Carson for three days in a row, trying to pick his brains and get everything out of him. And there's trust me three days are not enough to do that yeah. um <laughs> it provides just fantastic content oh yeah oh yeah so mentors are very very important and they don't it and and i know scott is a wealth of information and he's always there he's readily available on his cell phone text email even at two in the morning he's responding to a task and i'm like is he awake? What is he doing? You too. Um, I've had that also, actually. I, thought, I, I have. Thought this was me. <laughs> no, no, I've done it. I'm sorry, but I did. No, that's okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's amazing how he always responds within a few minutes, and he's he's asking your questions, further questions about the deal, and he's he's always helping you. So it's it's good to have that kind of support. Um, especially for people who have analysis paralysis, where I, I understand it's a lot of data. I was in that situation, and um, um, it, it kind of it, it's kind of scary to take that first step. So having a good mentor kind of helps you through that initial transition period. And once you're in the pool, you're just having fun. You got it. Well, we're um, closing in on the end of this uh, episode of the Note Poser. Uh, let's, yeah, Note Posers. Note Closers Show Podcast. Excuse me, everybody. Um, there's just two notes I want to add here. Um, if someone is uh, interested, I do have a handout for um, the content that we went over today. Um, I would be happy to send that out to anybody that would like it. Um, just uh, drop me an email, and I'll make sure we get that out to you. That's one thing. Uh, the other thing is that both Scott Carson and I will be present and speaking at a note conference being put on by the uh, Cincinnati and uh, Columbus uh, RIA associations that are headed up by Vena Jones Cox. Uh, this conference will be held August 11 and 12 uh, near Cincinnati, Ohio. I believe the town is Westchester, Ohio. So again, both Scott and I will be uh, speaking at the um, uh, Ohio uh, RIA um, con note conference near Cincinnati on August 11 and 12. Uh, any last thoughts, Patty? Anything else? No, I think one of the most important things is having a good power team is definitely uh, a, a great, great thing to do. And it doesn't have to be right away. You're not going to have this awesome team to start with. It takes time to build these relationships, like you said, Bill. Um, and as you keep going to conferences, as you keep speaking to more investors, as you keep, you know, talking to more people, you'll 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 start slowly building these um, relationships and contacts for your for your network. And um, if you don't have any um people in your network feel free to reach out to our note family everybody's always here to help you yep. um and uh, and some of the decisions are tough to make initially until you get a hang for it hang of it you gotta 
um, just take chances. And the only way you learn in this business is by doing it. If I tell you I've had success with a certain thing, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to just follow my footsteps and have the same kind of success. Um, so if you're having doubts about if you have to do it or not, if you have to do this or, or about any decision that you're struggling to make, feel free to reach out to either me or Bill here. Uh, we've added our contact information in the comments and uh, you can just go in and uh, contact us anytime at all. Um, again, I'm Patty Ped with Ader Financials and this is Bill with Grace Burr with Stonegate Capital. Yes. So thank you very much, Patty. I enjoyed this uh, visit with you. Oh, did we have any uh, questions or comments on Facebook from anybody? Again, if there's any questions at all, I will okay. and I will be happy to take them offline and reach out to you. That sounds great. Well, thank you again, and uh, thanks for listening, everybody. And that is how you climb the hill. Thank you very much, and have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye now. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, everyone.